Hello, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit this evening. You know, this virus has turned into an absolute nightmare for all of us, you know. And, you know, uh, today it got to me a little bit. There's days when I get a little bit down, you know, because of it. it you can't lead a normal lifestyle. Our lifestyles is, is so... Uh, so strange and unusual from what our normal lifestyle is, you know, and at times you get down a little bit with it, you know, and, and you guys are all the same way, you're all in the same boat, you know, so it probably hear, helps you to hear me talk about talk about how it gets me down, and it probably uh, helps me to, t to tell you guys how it gets me down, you know. The, the whole thing, you know, we're all in the same boat together. We're all working, trying to work through this disease. And, you know, I'm going to tell you something right up front. I think they are absolutely, absolutely, severely underestimating how far this disease has traveled through the population and how contagious it is. I was looking at a, a seeding map of... Uh, so I think it was in South Korea or some place of a restaurant where one person came in with the virus and the other people around in the restaurant caught it and they, they did a diagram of the of the interior of the restaurant and the chairs and the seating and everything and they showed which people caught it from that one person you know that was in the restaurant and how the and how the air flow through the restaurant probably carried it to the other people in the restaurant you know. Uh, I think it was like something like seven people or something caught it from that one person. And some of them were sitting like a hundred feet away, you know. I mean, it's just like, you know, this thing is just like, and that's why it spreads through the cruise ship so fast, you know. But you know what this means on the other side, too? If I'm right about this, and this thing is much, much wider spread than 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 uh, than they're giving it credit for. And the reason why it would be is because of asymptomatic transmission. In other words, people become asymptomatic, they spread to others, and they become asymptomatic. And it'll go through the population that way until finally it finds somebody who gets really sick and has to go in and get tested. You know, and it could be actually going through three, four, five hundred people before it finally gets to a person that gets it bad enough where they feel the need to go into the hospital and they say, hey, gee, we better test you and so on. And so I think that's why uh, the disease is much farther widespread. But at the same time, you know what that would mean? It would mean that the case fatality ratio would be much lower. In other words, and, it's all, and that would also mean that it's spread through the population much wider than we know. You know, and the case fatality ratio might be down, not a, a, a probably higher than the flu, but certainly not up in the like 6% or anything like that, or anything even near that, you know. And it would also mean that we're an awful lot further through this than they, than they, anyone could ever imagine. In other words, what I'm thinking is we might be just about halfway through, but I think another wave is coming. Uh, when they, people, people can't stay home forever. People have to work. They have to go to jobs. They have to make money and everything else, you know? And when they start going back to work and start going back to their jobs and stuff like that, well, then we're probably going to see a resurgence of the virus amongst the population. Uh, in other words, a second wave, you know? And this virus is a terrible thing because of what it's doing to the economy. It's absolutely ripping the economy to shreds. So when this virus is gone, it might be gone an awful lot sooner than people think. I'm thinking it probably will be gone by about September. That's what I'm thinking, you know. Uh, in other words, the final wave will work through the population, and, and then the virus can't find any new people to infect. Uh, then things will start to turn around, like later in the year, you know, maybe toward, I'm thinking maybe... Uh, maybe around the 1st of September, you know. And also, you know, people are healthier in the summer. They get lots of sunshine, you know. And there's lots of fresh fruit and vegetables to eat. And, 
and so on, you know, and, and the virus might just spontaneously start to disappear late in the summer. Not to say that it might not come back uh, maybe next spring or something like that. It possibly could, but but the people out there would have, a lot of them would have had it already, you know. And so it might be a little bit more like a, a regular flu than the next time it returns again, you know, because there's a certain amount of herd immunity then at that point, you know. At any rate, let's get to what might happen in September. We are walking a perilous tightrope line right now between inflation and deflation. You know, and the Fed's pumping a whole bunch of money into the system, but because of the tremendous deflation that this has caused, that money is just basically like, it's like Robin Peter to pay Paul sort of thing. It's kind of like uh, the plaster fits the sore, you know what I mean? So the money that they're creating is kind of just going in to fill the gap of the deflation, more or less, you know. But, you know, now that they've started dumping this excess money and they're, they're just supporting the repo market completely, they're supporting the stock market completely, and, and they're feeding all of the all of the swine on Wall Street are getting fat and rich, try to pull it away. You get a crash like you've never seen before, especially when we start to recover from this virus. So what happens in September? We start to recover from the virus a little bit, and people start working again around that time of year, and the economy starts to chug along to a certain degree. I mean, it probably won't make it up to what we've seen before, but there will be a little bit of a recovery. I don't, I'm not really anticipating an L-shaped recovery where we go along to the bottom and we stay on the bottom. I'm not, I'm not anticipating a V-shaped recovery. I'm anticipating recovery, though, but a, uh, how do I put it, a, 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 a recovery that's like in between. It, it, the economy does pick up a little bit, and things start to roll along a little bit again, but it's not, not the way it was where we had a, a, where we had a really good economy or a, or a sufficiently good economy, you know. And so this little bit of a recovery, and they're going to still have to be pumping the money in on the other end. What it's going to lead to, guys, is the real thing. This is really what we've been waiting for with gold and silver. We've been waiting for inflation. We've been going through a, a, a deflationary, just borderline, I mean, they're just, they're, the inflation numbers that they report, I mean, we've just been staying above inflation, barely above the line for the longest time now. Now, when the numbers come out on this crisis that we're in, we're going to see it's it's very deflationary. But when this ends, then I think we're going to see gold and silver start to really move. You know, they've done well through this crisis. And silver in particular is very vulnerable to short supply. You know, think about it, guys. The silver mines have all stopped, basically. And the silver mints, they're home right now, you know, because of COVID-19. You know, the the Canadian mint that produces uh, maples is at, is at half production. And I think the American mints completely stopped, you know. And so we're working with kind of a little bit of a silver shortage here, too, you know. And so I think gold and silver are going to start to really move along good once this virus starts to move out of the way and the economy starts to pick up. But we're going to move into a period of what's called stagflation. That's what's coming. And inflation. Worse than in the 1970s when we start to have this recovery. What I want to tell you guys about this is you when deflation is actually happening, you will not get a hyperinflation during a deflation. When you actually have deflation out there, and, you know, you're not going to get a hyperinflation during that period in time. But a, a deflation like that through history has been shown that it is the trigger mechanism for hyperinflation and inflation. It always has a trigger mechanism, and the trigger mechanism is a little bit of deflation like we're having right now. And when the economy starts to pick up, then what's called the velocity of money starts to pick up. 
Now, see, what they've been doing is pumping all of this money into the upper end of the economy, into the higher echelons. What is it? Trillions of dollars to stave off this deflation. And that money actually slows down the velocity of money because what it actually does is they, they stockpile that money. They put it in, they stuff it here and stuff it there. It's almost like you stuffing it in a pillowcase. They're stuffing it in their big, big fat bank accounts and stuff like that, you know. But what happens is, is it increases the volume of money, but that money's not moving. And so thereby slowing down the velocity. But when the economy starts to pick back up, then the money starts to move again. People start to borrow money for new projects and things like that, you know, and, and the economy starts to pick up a little bit. I, I'll give you a for instance. Right now, say you went down the, the boulevard of Main Street and say seven restaurants have closed up because they just couldn't keep going because of this crisis. Well, when the economy picks up, I'm expecting around September or October, you might see a new restaurant open up. It's, it, it, he'll be taking advantage of those seven restaurants that closed. And he and he'll start getting the business that those seven restaurants, so, so, but he'll have to borrow money from the bank and everything and buy all new chairs and a new oven for the kitchen and, and come in and, and have everything done. And he'll have to hire some company, you know, if he's going to open a new restaurant, he'll have to hire some construction company to come in and build everything. And then that construction company will start making money and people will start working and the economy starts to pick back up again a little bit. It's not what it was before, but it starts to pick up a little bit again, you know. And money starts to flow into the system, and money starts to change hands quicker. Like the construction company, they might have to dry, hire a drywall company to put in the, 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 the gyp rock and stuff in the new restaurant. And then they make money too, and there's off spins. So the economy starts to pick up. People start to actually work again, you know. Meanwhile, the Fed's off there are still printing a lot of money. They can't stop because if they stop, the economy will crash. Once they start supporting things, once they go into quantitative easing and everything, they can't stop. It's like, uh, I, I don't like to use the expression, monet, monet, like, but it's like almost like a drug addict, you know. Once he gets to a certain level, this is the way with them, you know, they start taking these things. They build up a tolerance. What's called a tolerance. They have to keep taking more and more and more. Because of the tolerance keeps getting higher and higher and higher. You see? Well, that's the way with this monetary thing, with the with the quantitative easing. It's on an inflationary curve. It's on a it's on an exponential curve. And so the the bankers like the central bank, they have to keep pumping more and more and more of the stimulus. And if they ever start to try to withdraw it away. Everything crashes. Well, they're going to be so interested in, in this recovery when it starts to happen and so interested in supporting it and nursing it along and bringing the stock market back up and bringing up all these markets again that they're going to keep pumping this monetary drug into the system. Then we're going to start to see the inflation. That's when we're going to see gold and silver really start to take off, guys. And cryptocurrency. It's going to be the golden day. This is when we're going to head up to $5,000 an ounce for gold. This is when we're going to have triple-digit silver. And it's what everybody's been, what, what all you guys have been waiting for for years. Some of you have got to the point of absolutely being disgusted. You know, you, you've bought silver and you've sold it all. Because <laughs> you're tired of waiting. And you know, it has been a long wait on this. You know, they they suppressed the price for years. And now we just had this big thing happen where the stock market fell. And they sold off their SLV and GLD in order to pay off uh, uh, margin calls and things like that because of a big sell-off in the stock market. What did it drop? I think it was 35% or something like that, rather abruptly. And, and this knocked the price, knocked the wind right out of gold and silver because they sold GLD and SLV that don't really represent the underlying asset because they have 
created these derivatives products in excess in order to keep pumping the price down lower on gold and silver. And then when they sell all those, it just drives it down even lower. And, and it doesn't uh, show the net worth of what gold and silver are actually worth, honestly, in the end, you know. So I'll tell you guys, it's been a rough go so far with this thing. When this thing started, you know, I said it was a black swan event. I pegged it right off the get-go, you know, uh, really early on. And uh, at the time when I was saying those things, I never realized it was turned into this, what it's turned into. I never realized it would be this bad. It's just horrible, horrible what it's been and how hard it's been on all of our lives. Not not just me, but you guys too. You know, you guys were all in the same boat suffering through this thing. And I tend to blame the Chinese. You know, that's my first gut initial reaction. But I don't really know where this virus actually came from, to tell you the truth. I'm suspicious of the Chinese. And I tend to blame them because it started in China. Maybe I shouldn't, you know. I because I don't really know. Uh, nobody I think knows a hundred percent sure actually where it actually came from, and where it actually originated. Uh, there's a big story out there that it originated in in the horseshoe bats. Uh, there's also a story that it started in the seafood market from from bats there and stuff. And then there's also the other story on the opposite side of the coin that stay, say it started in a, a lab in Wuhan. The Institute of Virology, or whatever it's called, you know, and the, and some people say, well, they were handling uh, bats the wrong way or something in there, and they were hiring workers and stuff that weren't qual. Well, you know, all these theories are out there about where it started, but now at this point, the cat is out of the bag, you know, and it's spreading through the world like like crazy glue. I've never seen anything so contagious in all my life. I mean, this is so contagious that I don't think a distance of just six feet is enough. If you got a person six feet away from you and they're coughing and sneezing with this thing, I wouldn't get within a country mile of them. You know, you might come down with it. It's that contagious. Uh, try to keep your immune system strong, guys. You know, try to take your vitamins. I just got through through taking... A thousand milligrams of vitamin C, two big chewable tablets. And I just got done taking a tablespoon full of cod liver oil. And also I had two uh, thousand milligram tablets of vitamin D today, you know. And uh, I'm trying to keep up, you know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep my immune system up there, you know, and everything. It's, it's, it's difficult. Oh, and I had a vitamin B12 this morning, you know, tablet, a vitamin B12 tablet this morning. And, you know, I'm not a guy that believes in vitamins. I don't like vitamins. And normally, I wouldn't take vitamins. But this thing has got me taking vitamins. You know, and, and probably when it's over, I'll probably quit. <laughs> you know, when it's gone, I'll be happy days when this thing's gone. You know, guys, I'm telling you, <laughs> I'll be happy days. I'm going to break open a big bottle of champagne when this thing is gone. I'm telling you, I'm going to I'm gonna go out there and I'm going to uh, have some fun and, and have a party or something when this thing's gone. I'll be so glad to see the backside of it, you know. <laughs> after the trouble it's been causing anyway listen guys have a good evening and uh i'll try not to let this thing get me down you know i'm trying to keep my morals up trying to keep my spirits up you know more my more mor not morals what do they have like two versions of that word morals and as in morality or or morals as in the keep your morals up like more, i just not quite catching on to that. Anyway, listen, guys, have a great night, what's left of it, and we'll catch you guys in the next show. Bye-bye.